The following is a presentation of the Healthcare Facilities Network. Hello, this is Peter Martin. Thanks for watching this video. Just wanted to give a quick plug for a recruitment that we are doing at Southeast Georgia Health System in Brunswick, Georgia. It is for a director of facilities management, so if you are interested in the opportunity, you can click this QR code, send me an email, or at the conclusion of this video, we have a link to a video we did that describes the opportunity at Southeast Georgia Health System. So two ways to connect. Number one, QR code. Number two, watch the video link at the conclusion of this episode. As always, thank you for watching, and now on to the show. My guest, John Crouch. John, good morning. How you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Excellent. Thank you for joining. John is the executive director of facilities at Advent Health, Wesley Chapel in Florida, just to the north of Tampa. John has accountability in his role for facilities engineering, security, biomed, and um, he's been the executive director there. For what, John, now? Uh, you've been with Advent for about 12 years, 13 years? Right. So I am, this is my 12th year of employment with them, and I've been the promoted to executive director from, from director of facilities to executive director a year, almost two years ago. Okay. And then John also serves, and this is where we met last December at the Florida Healthcare Engineers. John is also the state education chair for the Florida Healthcare Engineers Association. It was a very good conference, John. I uh, I enjoyed being down there. You guys did well. Well, thank you. I personally feel that uh, FHEA puts on probably the best conference in uh, the state of Florida. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate uh, being there. So, John, you have a very interesting background, which we will get into through the course of, of our conversation. But first, in your role as Executive Director of Facilities at Advent Health, what does that entail? So my responsibilities that you laid out also include uh, renovation and new construction and emergency management. Oh, wow. And uh, so I'm a professional juggler of responsibilities. <laughs> uh, I've learned decades ago that I had to let go of ownership of how you execute the task uh, throughout the day. And I have to empower and trust uh, those people I delegate to, because if I don't delegate, uh, I probably would have been dead from a heart attack and stress. But <laughs> So although it is a very stressful career, uh, I'm able to, uh, when I leave work, I do a pretty much, uh, I think I'm very successful in leaving behind uh, the stresses of the job to enjoy life. And um, is there anything, John, um, when you leave work, is there anything that you do as part of your routine or are you able just, because I've talked to some people who they'll go home and they play board games you to kind of decompress they'll listen to classical music and they'll turn off their radio. They'll turn off their, excuse me, their phone. Is there anything you do or is it just kind of naturally you're able to? I never had a desire to be a white collar worker. My father was a CEO, uh, town mayor uh, when I was growing up as a teenager. And I just could not picture myself enjoying that. And it's partially because I was bullied in high school and in junior high, uh, moving all the time and uh, having that face that says mess with me. So uh, with that, I did not really uh, excel in high school and, and, and junior high, and only because I spent more time thinking about the next combat, uh, combative situation uh, with the bullies, and which is really a, a disservice to people, uh, to kids, to pro you know, that stunts their uh, professional opportunities. So when I was in the Marine Corps, I was an aircraft mechanic majority of my time, and I loved turning wrenches and uh, repairing and troubleshooting. So as I neared the end of my career, um, I realized that I enjoy my quality of life that I have. Uh, and financially, what's that going to pay me if uh, I try to do that type of work in the civilian sector? And it would require relocating um, to a large metropolitan city at the time, which I wasn't interested in. So I got off through the education. And um, with that, I earned my associates in construction management and then followed on with my um, bachelor's in engineering administration. And I did all that while starting my first job as a um, plant operations manager in a hospital. And 
I did extremely well. Uh, graduated a 3.6 for both uh, college degrees, and which is not easy to do with a uh, science or an engineering degree. Right. And, uh, so I end up embracing the whole concept of uh, white collar work and management, and I really uh, love what I do because I have the opportunity to improve people's life, to give them that opportunity for that next promotion or that next pay raise, and uh, to give them that job that they're currently missing because they're unemployed. So I've really, really enjoyed the the people aspect, the human relations aspect of having a team. And uh, so no, although the team is significantly smaller than it was, I mean, the largest team I had uh, in the Marine Corps was 135 instructors and about 1,400 student Marines. And uh, so the responsibility is just as important. And I tell people all the time, whether you're, you got a team of three, or you got a team of a thousand plus, it all goes back to they all deserve the same quality of uh, leadership and management. So you sped through your career in just about two minutes there. Uh, <laughs> let me let me ask because I do want to go into the the Marine Corps experience and yeah. and and some of the things you mentioned there. You also used two words um, when you were introducing yourself. You, you talked about let you know you've learned to let go, and you said in your role you have to be able to let go. It's interesting um, choice of words because I was. I feel like when I do these shows now, I so often reference, I was talking to so-and-so who lost their job and I was counseling them yesterday. And I just happened to be talking to a gentleman yesterday and I said to him, you got to let go because he, he's having a really hard time moving on from what happened. And, you know, I think he was screwed, <laughs> you know, for lack of a better term, but you got to let go. You can't fight back against the machine until you let go. You're not going to be able to move forward. How did you, John learn to be able to let go? And was that a process for you? I remember reading um, in a, um, a newspaper that used to be called the Navy Times. And eventually the Marine Corps ended up having their own edition of it. But in the Navy Times, uh, as, as, a, as a young Marine, probably had six years experience, it was talking about mortality rate of those who choose to make the military a career. And I thought, holy cow. And they had talked about John Burnout and um, a lot of other key factors. And I thought, I don't want to be that way. And even talked about the um, having your shoulders up high. So I would find my shoulders up high all the time. Carrying That's a good, shoulders. have your shoulders up high is a, is a good, good thing. Not body posture, the tension <laughs> from uh, that you don't realize that you, you've got them up. When you're under a lot of tension and stress, your shoulders will rise up just a little bit. And um, I started noticing that in myself and I would consciously force myself to relax them. And I realized that I was trying to execute or to give detailed micromanagement instructions to my Marines. And I thought, no one ever micromanaged me. Why would I want to micromanage them? Let them accomplish the mission that they've been given. As an aircraft mechanic, rebuilding jet engines, we've all been to the same school. They know how to get it done. It's just about setting the priorities of what you want them to do. Uh, something that I really embraced was from artillery. I was never artillery, I was never on the ground forces, but they have something called shoot, move, communicate. <laughs> so they shoot the fire mission to support the troops by firing their artillery. Then they move so that they don't get counter fire coming back at them. And then they communicate to find out what the next fire mission is. And so shoot, move, communicate, and you had to let go as soon as you fired that mission. So when I would communicate to one of my Marines what I wanted accomplished today or this week, I'd have to trust that it would be done and executed on time um, as expected outcome. How they accomplish that outcome, I can't concern myself with. I need to focus on the bigger picture which is in front of us. And this is Peter Martin. If you or your organization is interested in advertising or partnering with the Healthcare Facilities Network, including sponsoring content, then please email me using the barcode in the lower right of your screen. From the trades level to the vice president level, from planning, design, construction, project management, compliance, safety, and security, the Healthcare Facilities Network reaches FM people where FM and people are. It served me well. I've never been thrown under the bus or uh, found out that uh, the person let me down. And, uh, but I think this is about making sure that they've got your respect, that they know that you're gonna do everything you can to support them with 
uh, the, the resources and the, um, the authority, the autonomy to make decisions. And, uh, but I still bear the brunt responsibility if it's a failure. And so that's always something that I just have to carry with me that, you know, I have to trust that they're going to do it, but I also uh, am the one that's to be standing there being held accountable for why it didn't happen as expected. Yeah. So in the, uh, in the Marines, did you, did you, what, what aircraft did you work on? Was it the Hornet? So I got the very end of the uh, F-4 Phantom jet okay. fighter and it transitioned uh, aircraft platforms, my, all the squadrons did, to the F-A-18 Hornet. Okay. And so that uh, was, I bet the best way to describe it is the F-4 Phantom was like the 57 Chevy of cars, you know, a very sex, sexy, masculine, you know, it, it speaks uh, the wow factor when you see them from our generation. And the F-A-18 Hornet, is more like a, a European uh, race car. And uh, I, I was, I'll, tell, I'll give you a great example of how they really thought about the mechanic for the first time in their life. And that was the F4 Phantom uh, with a team of five, it takes about three and a half hours to remove the engine. Not to put it back in, just to remove it. The FA-18 Hornet with a team of uh, five Marines, using hand tools, no power tools, no pneumatics, no battery operated tools, just hand powered tools. We can have that engine out in under 10 minutes. Wow. We can have another engine rolling in and have it all buttoned up and starting the engines at 18 minutes. I know because I set up my stopwatch and I said, I gotta see how fast we can do this. Cause I had a great crew and we've done it many times. And uh, it's um, really, really fascinating how they had built an engine that was built for the mechanic. Yeah, which, which did you prefer working on? I preferred working on the uh, FA-18 Hornet. And uh, I also spent more time working on it. I only spent a couple of years with the F-4 Phantom. And I worked directly at the aircraft level, but I also worked at the second level of maintenance known as AIMD. Uh, it's uh, our intermediate level of maintenance where we rebuilt the engines. So I was in the engine shop and we would uncrate the uh, engines that have been in storage, whether it be 30 days or three years. But we pull those engines out and we would disassemble them uh, completely, inspect all the components and then re re reassemble it with the uh, correct components because some are worn or cracked or fatigued or had reached uh, life expectancy and have to be replaced and then send it out to be uh, ran up in the test cell to make sure it's operational and then put it back in a can sealed up waiting uh, as a supply item to be sent to a squadron that needs an engine that may have sucked up an object and fought it or maybe the um, uh, uh, one of the modules of the engine which is really again fascinating how they designed the fa 18 hornet that engine was designed uh, you've got your fan module of three stages the compressor module, I believe it was 11 stages, as I recall. Behind that is a combustor module, then a turbine module of two stages, and then an afterburner module. And so each of those has um, components that measure stress. And then we have these removable hard drives and every flight we install them. And then every return flight, we pull them out and we put them in a mainframe and it strips the data. And so it says, all right, let's say you took off and you were going to do a cross country flight uh, from East Coast to West Coast, get up and level and just drive like a commercial aircraft and land. It may have been four hours of flight time, but the wear and tear may have only been an hour and a half. Huh. So those are called life used indices, Louis. And then yet you might take that same aircraft up for a 20 minute dog fight and you strip it and you say, I just put three hours of fatigue on this engine. And so the old methodology with all aircraft was at a certain number of hours of operation, you stop flying that aircraft, you remove that engine, and it gets fully disassembled, inspected, and rebuilt. With the Louis concept, life use indices, they say the compressor module uh, has uh, 10 flight hours left approximately. So let's go ahead and get that scheduled to uh, be swapped out. So what we'll do is we'll remove the engine, put a replacement engine in, the engine that was removed gets sent to uh, the next level of maintenance upstream, 
and they look at the um, documentation of, oh, we just need to replace the uh, compressor module. So they separate the engine and then pull out that compressor module and put another one that was rebuilt in and reassemble it and it's ready to go back in the service. So a lot of labor has been saved. Yeah. How much, uh, this might be a dumb question, but like how many hours how many hours do you get out of an engine under duress? You were talking about the dog fight, you know, maybe a 20 minute dog fight, yet you're going to put three hours. Is there a, a metric for an engine that, what is that metric where? Well, the F4 Phantom was 600 hours, 600 flight hours of flight. You had to pull the engine. I don't remember at this point, because I haven't had to think about it in a long yeah. time. And you got, uh, you got other PM things in your head right now. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so also just, you know, with your, your, your military experience, once a Marine, always a Marine, you were a drill instructor in the, in the Corps as well as a drill instructor. And we've all seen the role of a drill instructor. How do you decompress? Like you're involved all day, right? With it. How do you decompress? How do you, you talk about letting go, I guess, which is a, it's kind of like an easy question. Did you do that as a drill instructor too? What'd you do at the end of the day when you were alone? So this is the best way to describe it. You're never alone. So you're okay. either with the recruits or the officer candidates because drill instructors train officer candidates as well. And uh, you're with them the entire time they're awake. So for recruits, you're there with them uh, 16 hours a day minimum. Okay. And there are points in the training schedule where they don't get eight hours of beauty, beauty rest. They only get four or three or two when they're doing field training and they're learning night navigation and night movement because all Marines before they get their job skill have to learn how to be infantry. Then they can go get a job skill and uh, to do something different. But with that, you're there seven days a week, uh, six days a week, you are guaranteed to be with them uh, 14 to 16 hours. And so think about that. If you live off base, you even have a longer drive. You need to uh, eat, take care of your uniforms, sleep. So my first tour as a drill instructor, I slept an average of four and a half to five and a half hours a day. Wow. And think about it, we are doing more physio physical activity than the recruits because when they're running in formation, uh, at least two of the drill instructors are running faster up and down the length, making corrections uh, to the recruits. And uh, whether they're not loud enough, um, they're not aligned to the left and right, they're not covered down, trying to teach attention to detail and intensity. And so you're constantly yelling and screaming. And it's like doing crunches, thousands and thousands of crunches every day, the fatigue factor on your abdominal muscles. The good news is your abs can be exercised 24 seven, um, <laughs> unlike other body parts, but you're never alone. So when I got home, uh, I'd often have to, I'd have maybe a half an hour with the wife, 15 minutes with the kids, and uh, I'm getting ready for tomorrow, yeah. taking a shower, getting my uniforms all laid out, and uh, I'm up and at them and out the door, you know, 3, 30, 4, 30 in the morning, depends on what the event is. Wow. And the only day of any relaxation was Sunday, which means only one drill instructor could be there Sunday, and that's the one that spent the night with the recruits. And then he's alone until half hour before lunch. That's when the other drill instructors can come on board to then add the chaos to the training experience and uh, train them until taps or evening when they uh, go to bed. But there was no downtime there. In fact, there is times where at the end, ideally you'll have seven to 10 days to yourself as time off at the end of recruit training when you graduate them. But that wasn't always the case. There are a couple of times where I overlapped so my new recruits have already arrived before I've gotten rid of my wow. current ones. So I'm going from platoon to platoon back and forth. And so uh, it was very stressful, very, very stressful. Yeah. I guess I never really thought of it in that regard from the perspective of the drill instructor, you know, what, what they are going through as well. That certainly does sound that. How did you... Um... How did you did did you decide you want to become a drill instructor? How did that happen? So as a I was a lousy recruit, undisciplined. Uh, <laughs> I would stretch and move, and um, had no enthusiasm for learning how to manipulate the weapon. It called close order uh, close order drill, 
and uh, and the manual of arms. I just had no interest in all that stuff. But the uniform and the authority and the position was very uh, sexy, if you want to say. It was very interesting uh, for a young man. And as I matured as a young Marine, uh, I started having exposure to former drill instructors. And I was uh, very impressed on how everyone seemed to know that they were a drill instructor and uh, they rented a certain amount of respect to them. And uh, when they spoke, their words have authenticity. And uh, that's where that respect came from, not because of their title. And back then we didn't have ribbons indicating what your job was. And uh, so they came up with the ribbon concept during my uh, third, uh, third tour as a drill instructor when I trained officers. And um, before that, there was no recruiting ribbon, no um, drill instructor ribbon. Uh, you just wore your regular ribbons and your uniform was immaculate as always. And, uh, but I had met a lot of drill instructors and just wanted to be like them, to emulate them. And for me, it was Gunner Sergeant Dawson. Later on, I got promoted to Sergeant Major Dawson, became one of the most uh, uh, influential, uh, important uh, Sergeant Majors in the Marine Corps. And I had a chance to actually reunite with him a few years ago at a reunion and uh, thanked him for uh, inspiring me to have the courage to uh, attend drill instructor school and uh, follow in his footsteps. Wow, oh, inter interesting. Did you ever, um, as, a, as a drill instructor, did you ever second guess yourself? Did you ever second guess any of the decisions you made? I mean, because you've got this group of Marines who are, you you're molding and drilling. What's that like for you? And you got to be self confident in front of them. What's that like when you're off stage? So, when it comes to second guessing yourself, it might be that you violated the SOP, the standard operating procedure for recruit training. Uh, every violation of the SOP or any other written order is a court martial offense. Wow. Yes. So there is no misdemeanor concept in the Marine Corps or, or the military, I should say. And so everything is a court martial offense. There's three types of court martials. Each has different levels of severity, but there is something in the Ministry of Hearing known as non-judicial punishment. And uh, in the Navy, they call it uh, captain's mass. Uh, in the Marine Corps, they call it office hours, uh, but they can take away your stripes. Wow. They can take half your salary for two months. They can assign uh, restrictions on your movement, uh, that you're restricted to um, your home of domicile or your uh, uh, the barracks, if you live in the barracks, and give you extra assigned military duties in addition to your regular job. There's lots of things they can do to correct behaviors. And it all depends on what the offenses are. So uh, everybody makes mistakes because the commanding officers, I've heard so many different ones when they talk to the drill instructors, this, Marines, I want your toes on the line, the red line, the, the red line that you don't cross. Don't be playing it safe being way back there, away from the red line, because that means you're not intense enough. You're not creating the artificial stress that these recruits need. I want you to apply that artificial stress right up to the maximum limit of the red line, but don't cross my red line or I'm going to have to hold you accountable. <laughs> wow. So uh, <laughs> how about those for uh, career ending opportunities? <laughs> so. We make mistakes, whether it's how long we uh, administered physical punishment PT exercises uh, to correct behaviors. Um, and, uh, but yes, uh, but how do I second guess? We don't. Uh, so we uh, teach in the Marine Corps that hesitation kills. So it kills opportunity to change the tide of battle uh, or it changes the opportunity um, that you've exposed yourself to greater fire. There's a lot of dead Marines bones on the uh, the beaches when they landed uh, in World War II doing these island assaults because they were afraid to move forward under that incredible artillery and small arms fire that was annihilating them on the beach. But if you stay on the beach, you're going to die. Yeah. You have to move forward. Hesitation kills. And it even goes to the decision-making process. You have to process the information at hand and make a decision, this is what we're gonna do. And uh, in peacetime, the idea of uh, stopping and second guessing really comes up when uh, it's a safety issue. Uh, when you realize or become aware that we've created an unnecessary risk uh, of safety to the, uh, the injury or potential death of people uh, because the decision is being made, that's when it's appropriate to 
do that. But no matter how good your game plan is, as soon as the first rounds are fired in combat, um, uh, that dynamic of battle uh, is going to change. Um, and that's what we've been taught. I've never been to combat, but that's what we've been taught. Mm. Interesting. I'm, I'm actually reading, I'm looking over to it because I have it over here in my office. Not that I'm reading it in the office, but um, Ian Toll's trilogy of the war in the Pacific um, is mm. outstanding, outstanding. And I'm on the third, I'm on the third, third and final book now, but man, I, you know, that that war in the Pacific, you, we, we focus quite a bit on Europe and the Nazis and but the man, those Marines over in the Pacific. What a, well, I'm, glad what a, that, I'm glad that you mentioned that you read uh, military books. Uh, I was against the concept of reading rec recreationally until I was 35 years old. And as a really? drone, yes. So I was a drone instructor at the officer candidate school. And I thought I know all about the Marine Corps, but I don't know anything about the Navy. And the Navy's been using marine drill instructors since 1947. So I went and got me some books about Navy history so that I could know as much about their Navy history as I know about my Marine Corps history, because that's how you create pride of service, the organization you belong to. That's how you create in uh, very um, tangible visual examples of leadership and from their organization that they should try to emulate. And so using my examples of Marines, yeah, it's important, but uh, yeah, you can make the parallel, but they need to hear that people that were their predecessors in their organization, this is what they did that was remarkable. And so when I read my huge collection of books that I have on military, it's very rarely do they talk. In fact, the only time you really read about tactics is when you read about the Civil War. It really doesn't interest me. I want to know about the human story. And so therefore, uh, I've been very impressed with the amount of leadership that you can gather uh, reading these books about the human experience in combat. If that's, is that something that's similar to what you picked up from the books you chose to read about leadership examples in there? Yeah, you know, what, what I like about it um, is it, it helps frame and give a perspective on today as well. You know, the, of what what I love about history is we've gone through most things in the past, right? It, there there are similar things we can always we can always point to. The mil you know you were talking about that interplay between the Navy, the Marines for me in the Pacific, the way that they were able to cobble together the Navy, the Marines, MacArthur, all of those big egos in the Pacific, the, in the way Roosevelt managed them and King over in Washington, D.C., the way they were able to take the keep the Navy, the Marines and the big ego of MacArthur all kind of moving forward in one direction when, you know, there were different ideas for me is fascinating. In fact, I, I don't know if there's a book that talks about that relationship, you know, Nimitz and MacArthur and, and it's just and the Marines on the ground who were doing the dirty work um, and the way they would look at the army and say, oh, you guys aren't pulling your weight. So it's that, that whole Pacific theater to me is fascinating. And I love it because you do, you, you look at what they accomplished and how they accomplished and how they put their egos aside. The egos came back at the end of the war, right. but during those four years, you know, they were, they were pushing towards one goal. And that's what I, I, I love about it. And I love the civil war too. I do a lot of civil war reading, you know, especially these days where, you know, societies and, uh, you know, there's a lot of tumult around and not saying we're, we're 1860 or 1859, but again, there, there are parallels we can always find. And I think those parallels allow us to move through things. You can get through things if you subjugate ego, if you work together, if you realize there's something bigger. So that's a long soapbox. I apologize, but that's what I enjoy about reading history. Right. In fact, you gave me goosebumps in the fact that anytime I think about an experience that happened in my hospital in 2017, I get goosebumps usually when I think about it. And we had a brand new chiller being installed, a thousand ton chiller, centrifugal, and the subcontractors that were doing the work failed to communicate to each other, the electrician and the, um, and the uh, mechanical contractor. So wow. one of them had left the uh, shutoff valve uh, that would normally be open when the chiller is running had left it in the off position. So on the discharge side of the pump, this huge pump that's got, I think it's a 14 inch diameter uh, pipe, 
put out tremendous volume of water under tremendous pressure, chilled water typically is around 42 degrees. That 42 degree water on a Friday afternoon when they quit work with the valve and the off position, but the pump was running. Wow. And it wasn't visible to us on the graphics yet because they were still doing the commissioning of this chiller. We were unaware that the chiller was running. We were unaware that the valve was in the shut position because it hadn't been turned over to us yet. And Friday evening, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, that thing kept running and churning. So 42 degree water deadheading at the discharge side of a pump he has resistance. Resistance has heat. Those water molecules got hotter and hotter. It got more than 212 degrees, I tell you, because the um, rubber belt, the rubber coupling that connects two pieces of pipe that allows movement to occur when they're not perfectly aligned, it's the thickness of a truck tire. It swelled, blew out, and sent out a shock wave. And that shock wave would have killed anybody that was in the plant. Uh, the reason I'm confident of that is because the um, shock wave, when it exploded out that one position around the 360 of that coupling, it hit 10 feet across and it took out uh, two variable speed drives for the wow. HVAC system. Then uh, it took out every single one of our uh, field control panels for the building automation system. So wow. we no longer had the ability to know where any set point was or any component was operating. It was all dead because that shock wave that hit it and destroyed the cabinets and the contents thereof. It reflected and went 65 feet backwards to two sets of garage doors that you'd find in a huge uh, central energy plant that are very thick metal and it blew them out like a car had ran into them and so if you were in there that shock wave would have killed you or horrifically injured you yeah guaranteed traumatic brain injury would have happened so now i've got a dead hospital so this happened at 5 35 p.m we all left at 5 30. now all the way up until the preceding friday for all those years that we were in operation we left at six o'clock. My manager came to me Fridays and said, John, I want our guys to be able to eat with their family. Wow. I'm leaving at six o'clock, six o'clock just that doesn't do it. And I looked at a trend on the number of work order requests that we get between 5.30 and six, it's rare that it even happens. I says, fine. So he told them, he says, if you're here at 5.31, I'm gonna make your life miserable. Wow. You will be gone every day from this point forward at 5.30. So it's almost like divine intervention, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And so with that, we all had left the campus. And then the place went into fire alarm. And the house supervisor calls me. It's now about 5.38. I'm on my motorcycle driving home. I lift up my phone. And I go, oh, it's the house supervisor. I pull off. I call her back. She says, there's been a significant event that happened in the chiller plant at the central energy plant. And I don't know exactly what's going on but the fire department just arrived. And so with that, um, I sent a text to everybody that says, emergency, something happened in the chiller plant, all hands on deck. And everybody you know, got the message, they turned right around and all came back. I've got a hospital in South Florida in the month of um, August that okay. is gonna get hot real quick. Yeah. And uh, so with that, I start working with the house supervisor. We did an incident command. Uh, we're planning an evacuation because I don't know if I can get this uh, chiller plant operational again with all the damage that occurred. And with that, um, my two master electricians, um, Ed Burchette and uh, Paul Garcia, they went ahead and they took the components of two variable speed drives and made one functional variable speed drive and Paul called me an hour and 20 minutes after this event started and says, John, don't evacuate. We've got it operational. We should see a difference in 10 minutes. Wow. So I rate the, and the, the fire uh, chief from uh, the county, um, Chief Reardon, he had already heard about this event within 20 minutes of it happening because he monitors what's going on with his radio traffic. 
So he was on site and we were coordinating ambulances to come get our most critical patients and relocate them elsewhere uh, in the community so that um, they would get the best health care possible. And the good news is we did not have to, but wow. everybody was acting with great autonomy to solve this problem and make it happen because they did not have a workplace culture that intimidated them about making a wrong decision. They did not have a workplace culture that required that they always get permission because I've always trained my Marines and I've always trained my uh, civilian uh, employees for the last 20 years in healthcare that they have the autonomy to make any decision that they need to make in the best interest of patient care. And uh, I will back them up. How do you, um, how do you work with an employee or a Marine who, who didn't necessarily want the autonomy? They were still wanted to be tethered to, how do you go about moving that, a person from the tethering to the autonomous decisions? So I've only had a couple of times that that's ever happened. And it's actually at the front end of my career as a plant operations manager. Um, I'm very lucky and fortunate that the team I have now is a brand new hospital. So it's a brand new team. So if I look at them three years later and say, who hired this moron? Oh, it'd be me. <laughs> so uh, you don't always get it perfect, but uh, you right, try. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm very fortunate in who I selected for my current team. The other two teams I inherited, and there was resistance in both teams because they didn't like the idea of cross-training. Because I've always run the operation that I'm not interested in hiring the best plumber. I'm interested in hiring a customer service expert with a specialty in plumbing, hmm. but touches every system. So I don't have a need for multiple plumbers in my different hospitals that I've worked at because there's, you know, they're, they're campus size. And so therefore uh, I only have a need for one plumber at my current campus, but I'm not going to limit him to only doing plumbing things. He's yeah. going to touch electricity after he's been signed off by the two electricians. He's going to touch HVAC after he's uh, been told what he can and cannot do in HVAC. And all my employees end up earning their universal license uh, for EPA so they can actually breach the system. But 70% of the problems that you uh, troubleshoot in HVAC don't require breaching of the refrigerant system. They're electrical problems, mechanical problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, my people are all cross-trained. They bring a specialty, but that number one specialty is always customer service. And so when I had these people that were reluctant, I said, listen, I'm not going to allow the bar to stay where it's at. It may be there when you hired on, and it may, it may have been there when I arrived, but I raised the bar. And this is the new standard, the new expectation. Now, I'll help you get there, but you're going to get there. <laughs> if you think that you're going to ride out the next six years before you retire, because you had already mentioned that you had an intent to retire in six years, well, you won't be retiring here. Because I need your effort to be a contributing member of this team. I'm not going to wait for you to retire and then replace you as somebody with the right work ethic. This mm -hmm. is what I expect from you, and I will help you. And so uh, that's one of the things that, that um, we may talk about uh, in this conversation. That um, what I, in fact, I made note of it of something I would do want to talk about at some point, and that is the uh, the moral obligation as a leader in facility management that you have to ensure that you acquire funding to uh, reinvest in your staff to get them training. And it may benefit them that they get a certification that's good on their resume. It may make them more desirable to work elsewhere. But if you have the right work culture, they're not going to want to leave. This concludes episode one. Please return to the Healthcare Facilities Network in the near future to view episode two. And as always, thank you for watching.